I'm not taking attendance anymore. Um, but I hope people keep coming to class. But I decided that's enough attendance. So any questions so far? Either what we're talking about or the programming assignment or stuff in general? For uh, examination purposes, mm -hmm. are we going to have to be able to be fairly capable in calculating and, and um, modular? Um, yeah, for a few things. And we're going to talk about some other applications of modular stuff like modular exponentiation. And you'll probably see some questions that have you do that. Um, but we'll get some practice with it. Yeah, I'm not too, it's not that I don't understand and can't do it, but I'm not too quick with it. So. Okay. Um, you yeah. Definitely use some practice. Okay. And I'm thinking Wednesday I'll have some stuff for people to work on on the board related to modular operations and such. Okay. So we'll get some more practice there. Other questions? All right, so you remember what a prime number is? So it's a number that's only divisible by itself in one. And if it's not prime, we say it's composite. And so every number other than one is either prime or composite. One we just don't talk about a lot for some reason. Um, And primes are particularly useful um, because of something called the fundamental theorem. Of arithmetic. Every discipline seems to have a fundamental theorem. There's a fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, there's a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, which, which to write it formally would take a lot of legalese, but the basic gist of it is um, a positive integer let's say bigger than one can be written uniquely with an asterisk as a product of primes. And the asterisk is up to um, rearranging the order. So for example, 20 can be written as 4 times 5. Well, 4 is not prime, but 4 can be written as 2 times 2, and 2 is prime. So 20 can be written as 2 times 2 times 5. Okay. Clearly, we could also write it as 5 times 2 times 2, or we could write it as 2 times 5 times 2. But these are all the same set of primes, the same number of times. They're just rearranged. So we don't consider those to be um, different ways of writing 20 as a product of primes. We consider them all to be the same because they're just rearrangements. But this is telling us that we can't, for example, write 20 as 7 times 3, right? Um, so if you ignore the order, you can write it as a product of primes in exactly one way. And if a number is prime itself, it's just, you know, 13. And if it's composite, we can find a product of primes and that product is unique. That's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, and it's not obvious why that should be true, but it is. 
And it turns out that um, there are other systems of numbers we can work with, things like the complex numbers, where this fundamental theorem does not apply, where we can define primes the same way we define them with integers, but in that case, numbers can be written in multiple ways as products of primes. And that was a disturbing fact when people realized it. Um, let me mention a sidebar here, because we've got to mention it sometime. So you know about these things, right? If you do Pythagorean triangles, z is the length of the hypotenuse, x and y are the length of the two sides, and this relationship always holds. And the Greeks were interested, as I've said before, in whole numbers, so they were interested in things like um, a 3, 4, 5 triangle and the observation that 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared or 5 squared plus 12 squared is equal to 13 squared. And there are some triangles you can make where all three sides are an integer length. And of course we know there's some you can't, for example, 1, 1, 2, that's not even a rational length. It's the square root of 2. Um, but these Pythagorean triples, 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, um, pop up a lot. And if 3, 4, 6 works, you can be sure that 6 squared plus 8 squared is equal to 10 squared. And so the Greeks studied this question of how can you find three integers, x, y, z, such that x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And they had good success with this. They were able to come up with general formulas that covered all the possible ways that you can solve this equation in integers. Um, and studying equations in integers is an interesting thing, and these are, are sometimes called Diophantine equations. These are equations that look like plain old algebraic equations, but we're asking for a solution in integers. And when you start having things like this, you've got three variables. There's a lot of ways you could solve this, but a lot of them involve fractions or irrational numbers. So um, a big question was, is there a way to find integers that satisfy this equation, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed? And there's a few obvious ones. We could have x, y, z be 0, but that's not a very interesting solution. We could set x equal to 0, and then we could say 0 cubed plus 7 cubed equals 7 cubed. Well, that's obviously true, but it's not very interesting. But is there a way where, where these things are not, um, you know, sort of the obvious answers where you're using 0? Are there, like, interesting integers where the sum of two cubes is equal to the cube of another integer? And the Greeks were never able to find a, um, a solution to this equation. And a mathematician named Fermat was reading a book on Diophantine equations and came to a section that was talking about this. And, you know, here's the book, and it's got all this stuff. And here's the edge of the page. And um, after he died, somebody found his copy of the book on Diophantine equations, and he had written a little note in the margin next to this that said... Um, Fascinating, there's no solution to this equation in integers, and more generally, the equation x to the n plus y to the n plus z is equal to z to the n. This has no solution in integers for any n bigger than 2. So it doesn't work for cubes, doesn't work for fourths, doesn't work for fifths, doesn't work for any integer other than squares. And he made a note in the margin saying, I've discovered a wonderful proof of this, which this margin is too small to contain. And the first somebody found this was after he had passed, and they were reading his copy of this book, and they saw this note in the margin, and they're like, ah, oh, Fermat had proven this theorem, but we don't know what his proof was. And so people began trying to figure out how to prove that this solution cannot be solved. And for hundreds of years, people tried to solve this proof to either find an example where you could write this equation or to prove that it could not be done. And a lot of people thought they came up with proofs, and those proofs just fell apart one by one. And one of those proofs fell apart because the person doing the proof um, 
thought that in this other system of numbers that he was working with, this fundamental theorem applied. He thought that primes, um, a prime decomposition was unique. And he came up with a proof of what's called Fermat's last theorem. And somebody discovered that he had assumed unique decomposition and showed that that's not the case in this system. And he invented a whole new branch of mathematics called ideal theory to try to restore unique factorization into this, this domain of numbers he had. So this problem has been around for hundreds of years and it's just spawned all kinds of, of interesting mathematics. Um, and it was finally proven in the early 90s. Um, and the proof is almost certainly not something that Fermat had access to. <laughs> it used decades of machinery developed in an area called algebraic geometry and just all kinds of very deep results um, and powerful mathematics. And most likely Fermat had an idea in his head that if he had developed it, he would have discovered that the proof didn't actually work. Um, but it's such a simple equation, right? I mean, you almost couldn't ask for a simpler equation. And yet so elusive to prove that you can't solve this for n bigger than 2. But it was eventually proven. So that's Fermat's last theorem. And it shows up in <coughs> popular press and movies and things like that, Star Trek episodes. Um, so it's a good theorem to know. All right, so over integers we have unique factorization. That's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, we talked about the sieve of Aristosthenes. We talked about trial division where you just divide a number by every possible factor. Um, so here's another question the Greeks pondered, um, which is how many prime numbers are there? And in particular, is there an infinite number of prime numbers, or is there such a thing as a largest prime? And everything beyond that can be written as a product of this finite set of primes. And that's a good question to ask. And if it turned out to be a finite set of primes, we'd have trouble with cryptography, because <laughs> we could make a table of all the primes, and that would crack our cryptography pretty easily. But it turns out there's an infinite number of primes. And it turns out it's pretty easy to prove that. So we prove it by contradiction. Suppose the set of primes is finite. So let's call the primes P1, P2, P3, Pn, where n is the number of primes. So that's a, a collection of all the prime numbers that there are. So make a number B, which is equal to P1 times P2 times P3 times Pn plus 1. So that's a big number, and in particular, b is bigger than pn, because it's pn times a bunch of other stuff, plus 1 added to it. And since it's bigger than pn, so b must be composite, right? Because we picked pn to be the biggest prime. So we multiply all the primes together, add one, that cannot be a prime number, so it must be divisible by some prime number. But if you look at how B was constructed, it's one more than a multiple of P1, it's one more than a multiple of P2, it's one more than a multiple of P3, it's one more than a multiple of every prime number. So none of these primes from P1 through Pn can divide it. So pi 
does not divide B for any I from 1 through N, and that's a contradiction. And so the only conclusion is the set of primes can't be finite, it must be infinite. So there are an infinite number of primes. So that's a good fact to know for like tests and stuff. The contradiction is that because most, none of the primes that you assume to exist divide B, then B must be prime. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. Well, we know there's an infinite number of primes now. Um, but it gets harder and harder to be a prime number the bigger you are. Right? 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. We've got 6 primes just between 2 and 13. It's almost every other number except 9. But when you get up to around a million or a billion or a zillion, you got a lot more things that might divide you. You got all the primes less than your yourself that could be factors of you. And so it feels like the spacing between primes tends to get bigger and bigger. And that does happen in general. So here's a question. So let P of X equal the number of primes less than or equal to X. And it certainly grows, right? The bigger X is, the more primes we have less than or equal to X. But in fact, you know, the number of primes, it's a number, it's always an integer. So this is actually, you know, got some stair-stepping to it. And sometimes you find these big dry spells where there's no primes between here and here. And then all of a sudden it jumps up one more. And so an interesting question is, what is the nature of this function P of X? What does this look like? It's not a line, it actually seems to flatten out the further out you go. But we know it never levels off, because if it does, that means there's no more primes beyond some point. So it's always increasing. It, it always gets to a higher value if you go out far enough on x. But what does it look like? And it turns out there's this beautiful result. So I'm going to throw a limit at you. Turns out that as x gets bigger and bigger, p of x gets closer and closer to the natural log of x. So that's the log base e. And that's a little weird. Because what does e have to do with integers at all? e is this 2.718, it's this function that pops up all over nature. And e to the x is this function whose derivative is equal to itself. So it's a function that specifies its own growth rate. If you want to know how quickly this function is growing at some point, just look at the value of the function. That's what it's telling you is not only the value of the function, but how quickly the function is growing. And that's part of why it pops up in nature. Because populations do this. The bigger the population, the faster the population grows. And you can find connections between population growth rates and E. Well, here's a connection between E and how many prime numbers you find up to some point. So this is called the prime number theorem. Um, and it's a beautiful result. And we're not going to prove this, unfortunately. <laughs>
All right, while we're on the subject of of E, have you seen this? So take E and raise it to a power I pi, where pi is just pi, and I is a square root of negative one, so an imaginary number. And who knows what E to the I pi is equal to? I know you do. Tell us. Negative one. Negative one. And if that doesn't bake your noodle. All right, so we got this base of natural logarithms E, we got pi, right, circles, we got I squared to minus one, and you put them all together and you just get plain old negative one. That's a little weird. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I had two students in separate years who had that tattooed on their arms. <laughs> Because if you're going to put something on there, that seems like a pretty good one. That's like fundamental to something that we don't understand. Um, but to me, that's a beautiful result. So all these things tie into each other in ways that we don't necessarily understand, right? A lot of mathematics, especially pure mathematics, is about trying to understand these things at a deeper level and trying by extension to understand maybe the universe or reality or existence at a deeper level. Um, and you can do very pure abstract mathematics and suddenly run right into something that's very much part of the real world. And that's, um, that's always kind of startling. All right, one more uh, property of primes and then I'll throw some open questions at you. Um, So every odd number, if n is odd, then n is congruent to 1 or n is congruent to 3 mod 4. How do we know that? Because if something's congruent to 0 mod 4, it's definitely not prime. It, sorry, it's definitely not odd. It's a multiple of 4. If it's congruent to 2 mod 4, it's 2 more than a multiple of 4. So it's, you know, 4i plus 2, which is just 2 times 2i plus 1. It's still got to be an even number. So your odd numbers have to be 1 more or 3 more than um, a multiple of 4. So if we look at an odd prime, um, so any odd prime is congruent to 1 or congruent to 3 mod 4. Well, if something's congruent to 1 mod 4, it can be written as 4 times some integer plus 1. If it's congruent to 3 mod 4, it can be written as 4 times some integer plus 3. So every prime has one of these forms, but the question is, is there an infinite number of primes in each form? Or is there only a fixed set of primes that can be written as 4 times an integer plus 1, and then all the other primes are 4 times an integer plus 3? And this is really talking about arithmetic progressions. So if we start off with k equals 1, this gives us the number 5. If k is 2, this gives us 9. If it's 3, it gives us 13, 17, 21, and so on. Whereas this gives us 7, 11, 15, 19, 23. And we can ask, are there an infinite number of primes in this progression? And we could ask, are there an infinite number of primes in this progression? And it turns out that the answer is yes. So if A and B have no common factor, besides 1, then the set of all a times k plus b, where k is um, a natural number, contains infinitely many primes. So any reasonable arithmetic progression we make, pick some starting number and then just go up by a fixed amount, any progression like that that you do within reason is going to have an infinite number of primes. And I say within reason because, for example, if I start with 5 and I add multiples of 5, 
I'm going to have one prime, which is 5. Because 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, they're all going to be divisible by 5. But if A and B don't have a common factor, this gives you an infinite number of primes. The trick is we don't know which of the numbers in that progression are prime. But we know that there's an infinite number. So let me mention a few open. Yeah. Okay. So let me mention a few open problems, problems that we don't have an answer to. Um, and again, these are these are problems that attract a lot of of so-called amateur mathematicians, people who aren't trained in mathematics, but still want to try to prove these things or disprove them. And that's totally doable, right? I mean, if you can understand what the problem is asking, you can try to find a solution to it. Um, and I personally believe that, you know, sometimes these so-called amateurs are more successful than the experts because the experts tend to all be doing the same thing because they've been trained. And they think this is how we go about doing this kind of proof. And sometimes it takes someone from a totally different perspective to come in and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about it this different way. And sometimes that's productive. Um, so I think these are fun questions to think about and play with. Um, you good? Yeah. Okay. So, so here's a really simple one to think about. Um, three and five are prime. 5 and 7 are prime, 11 and 13, 17 and 19, 29 and 31. What all these pairs of primes have in common is that they're separated by 2. Right? They're consecutive odd numbers that are both prime. And these are called twin primes. So here's a really simple question. Are there an infinite number of twin primes or not? And nobody has an answer. They definitely get less and less frequent, but we know that primes start to get less frequent in general. But if you keep looking far enough, eventually you stumble across a pair of consecutive odd numbers that are both prime. And this has been tested up to some really high number. But nobody's proven that there must be an infinite number of these, so that's an open question. All right, here's another open question. This is going to be your second programming assignment, I think. Take the number 6. I can write that as the sum of two primes, 3 plus 3. 8 I can write as 3 plus 5. 10 I can write as 3 plus 7. Or I could write it as 5 plus 5. 12 I can write as 5 plus 7. So I can take even numbers and I can write them as the sum of two primes. If I want, I can even do this with 4, 2 plus 2. But can I always do this? Can I take any even number and write it as a sum of two primes? And that's something called Goldbach's conjecture. And Goldbach's conjecture says, yes, you can take any even number and write it as a sum of two primes. But nobody's been able to prove that or find a counterexample. If you solve any of these, by the way, you're like rich and famous, or at least famous. Some of these come with like million dollar cash prizes. Um, there's this thing called the Millennium Problems. You can look it up. And I think each of the Millennium Problems is worth a million dollars if you solve it. So it's not a bad way to spend a weekend. <laughs> so Goldbach's conjecture, I don't know if there's money for that one, but that's, that's an open question that um, is waiting for a solution. So PI2, I think I'm going to make you have you write a program that will test even numbers and find out how to write them as a sum of two primes, and then try that for some values. All right, let me mention one other um, 
question at you. This has to do with the idea of perfect numbers. So take a number and write down all of its factors other than itself. It doesn't just have to be prime factors, but all of its factors other than itself. So 4, for example, is equal to 1. Um, 4 is divisible by 1 and is divisible by 2. And those are the only factors. 5 is just divisible by 1. 6 is divisible by 1, 2, and 3. 7 is just 1. 8 is divisible by 1, 2, and 4, and so on. Okay, add these together. And you can see a few things. First of all, if the sum of a number's factors is equal to 1, that number is prime. That's pretty easy to see because the only factor is going to be 1. A lot of times the sum of the factors is smaller than the number. Sometimes it can be bigger. But every now and then the sum of the factors is equal to the number itself. If that happens, then we say it's a perfect number. So a perfect number is a number whose sum of factors is equal to the number itself. I think so. Yeah, I called them happy and sad when I was a kid, but yeah. <laughs> so 24 has factors 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 12. So that's 20, 30, 3, um, that adds up to 36. So that's an abundant number or a happy number. 28 has factors 1, 2, 4, 7, and 14. That's 14, 25, 27. The sum is equal to 28. That's a perfect number. And it's been proven that there is an infinite number of these perfect numbers. And they're related to these Mersenne primes that we talked about at the end of the last class. Um, these primes that look like 2 to the n minus 1. But what nobody's ever done is find an odd perfect number. And nobody's proven that they can't exist, but nobody's found one either. So that's another open question. Are there odd perfect numbers? An odd number that's equal to the sum of its factors. And it's an open subject. So lots of stuff we don't know related to primes and divisibility and numbers in general. Questions on any of this? None of this is stuff we're going into to a very deep level. I'm just kind of trying to give you a feel for the landscape here and some of the, the questions that are out there. But we are going to go deeper now. All right, so there's something called the greatest common divisor, or GCD, sometimes called the greatest common factor. This is what you use when you're simplifying a fraction. Right, if you have something like 15 fortieths, how do you reduce that to 3 eighths? Well, you find the largest number that divides both of these, and you divide by it. So 5 is the largest factor that these two numbers have in common. Divide 15 and 40 by 5, you get 3 eighths. So we can ask, what's the greatest common divisor or factor of two numbers. And there's an algorithm for finding out the answer. And this is called Euclid's algorithm. So let's say we want to find the greatest common factor of 40 and 18. 
Okay, so this is an algorithm. This is something we could put into a computer. And you'll actually do this in one of your programs in 223, I think. Okay, so here's how this algorithm works. We got two numbers, 40 and 18. I'm going to start with the larger of the two numbers. I'm going to write that down. And I'm going to try to write 40 as something times 18 plus something left over. So we're doing this modulo reduction. So how many times can 18 go into 40? Two times. That's 36, so I've got four left over. So 40 equals two times 18 plus four. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about the two. I'm interested in the 18 and the four. I'm going to take this and bring it down here. And I'm gonna take this and bring it down here. And I'm going to write a new problem now. And my new problem is to write 18 equals something times four plus something. So how many times does four go into 18? Four times, that's 16, we've got two left over. And I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna bring that down, bring this down. And I'm gonna write four equals something times two plus something. So two goes into four two times, there's zero left over. Once I do that, this is my GCD. So that's just an algorithm. It works for good reasons, but we can also just believe it works and do it. But it basically works because this is the remainder when you divide 40 by 18, right? So anything that divides 40 and divides 18 is going to divide their difference. Well, any, any factor of 40 and 18 is going to be a factor of 40. It's also going to be a factor of 18. It's going to be a factor of 2 times 18. And since it's a factor of this and it's a factor of 40, it's a factor of their difference, which is this number over here. So the GCD of 40 and 18 is also the GCD of 18 and 4. And the GCD of 18 and 4 will also be the GCD of 4 and 2. And since this remainder is always less than this number, if we do this enough times, eventually we will get down to where this is a zero. And when this is a zero, it means that this thing is a multiple of that, right? And so two is a factor of itself and it's also a factor of this number on the left. And if we happen to start off with two numbers that are multiples, where one's a multiple of another, for example, the GCD, of 45 and 15. Uh, 45 equals something times 15 plus something. Well, this goes in three times with a remainder of zero. The fact that I got a remainder of zero on my first line of this means that 15 divides 45. So the GCD is just 15 that's the biggest possible factor of 15 and it's also a factor of 45. And if you happen to do this in the other order, like let's find the GCD of 18 and 40, well I would write 18 equals something times 40 plus something. Well 40 goes into 18 zero times with 18 left over, and then I'll bring those down and say 40 equals something times 18 plus something, and I'm back to where I started over here. So you don't actually have to start with the biggest number on the left. One step will get you back to where you want to be. Now I wouldn't do this with negative numbers. If you want to know the GCD of 40 and negative 18, it's going to be the same as the GCD of 40 and 18, but with a minus sign thrown in, um, or not. So I would just work with the positives. But anyway, that's Euclid's algorithm. Um,
You want to see one more? So let's do the GCD of 735 and 252. All right, so how many times does 252 go into 735? I don't know. It goes in twice with 231 left over. So 735 is two times 252 plus 231. Bring these over. 252 equals something times 231 plus something. Well, that sounds like it goes in there once. And how much is left over? 21. Carry those over. And if you don't want to think too hard and you got a calculator, I can just do 231 divided by 21. Oh, well, it happens to go in exactly 11 times. But if it went in 11.2, then I'd know it went in 11 times, and I'd subtract 11 times 21 from 231, that would give me the remainder. Um, but it turns out that goes in exactly 11 times, plus zero. And so this is the greatest common factor. So, uh, 735 is 21 times 35, and 252 is 12 times 21. And if we didn't know Euclid's algorithm, we could factor 735. And this turns out to be 2 squared times 3 squared times 7. 4 times 9 times 7. And 252 turns out to be 2 squared times 3 squared, that's what I just wrote, 735 is bigger than that. 735 is 3 times 5 times 7 squared. But remember, factorization is unique, so if we want to find a common factor, we have to look for common prime factors in the way each of these numbers can be written. Well, we see 2 goes into this number, but it doesn't go into that number. But 3 goes into both numbers, it only goes into this number once. It goes into 252 twice, but it goes into 735 only once. 5 goes into 735, but doesn't go into 252. 7 goes into this number once, this number twice. So there's a 7 common factor. Multiply those, there's your 21. So Euclid's algorithm is getting at that result. All right, one definition and then a break. If M and N have a greatest common divisor of one, then we say M and N are relatively prime. They may not be prime numbers themselves, but relative to each other, they have nothing in common. So we say they're relatively prime. For example, 8 and 9. And the greatest common divisor of these two numbers is 1. So they're relatively prime, even though both of those numbers are not prime. But if we take two primes, certainly their greatest common factor is 1. So 13 and 17, the only thing that divides either of those is 1. So that's going to be their greatest common factor. But even if the numbers aren't prime, they could be relatively prime. And that'll be useful in doing some crypto stuff. All right, so take five minutes, and we'll um, we'll look at some other calculations we can do using modular operations.